Hello and welcome to the webinar titled Intelligent Automation in Financial Services jointly presented by Nugen Software, a global software vendor with products and solutions in the space of business process management, enterprise content management, customer communication management, and Forrester, one of the largest finance uh, research and analysis firms in the world. I thank you all for the overwhelming response we have received for this webinar. My name is Ritesh and I should be your host and moderator for this webinar today. We are privileged to have with us Mr. Craig Leclerc, Vice President and Principal Analyst at Forrester and Mr. Varun Goswami, who heads the Center of Excellence for Intelligent Automation at Nugen Software. The, the esteemed gentlemen would be discussing their views, perspectives, and how do they see uh, the intelligent automation industry to be working in the financial services market today. We are in a state of unprecedented crisis. We are all taken in by a virus which is minuscule in length, and for the first time probably over the ages, it has put the entire world into one uh, one place where it's fighting the a common enemy under lockdown. Automation has achieved a new paradigm in today's times. With social distancing and contactless gaining more importance, automation and robots probably are the next big thing that's happening. So it's time for intense, intuitive, and intelligent financial services industry and what better way to do it rather than just automation. I would like to invite Mr. Leclerc uh, to discuss on intelligent automation, that's RPA, DPA, and AI in the financial services industry. Over to you, Mr. Leclerc. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me get my screen showing here, and uh, it's great to speak with everyone about a topic I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about, you should be seeing my uh, first screen, which is uh, really titled uh, Intelligent Automation, is what we've seen uh, developing in the market is this combination of automation tools that are uh, being organized to help uh, with uh, process uh, at companies, and they're having a particularly strong effect in financial services. Now, just a, a few words on uh, from the, 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 the highest altitude, if you will, um, the impact of um, where we've been, uh, Forrester has forecasted in two scenarios, um, A and B. Um, now, um, there are many economists that have uh, d have different views of, of, of the, the depth of the recession. Uh, there's very little disagreement that we are in a recession and will be in one for, for some period of time. You know, scenario A, which uh, we put about a a 30% probability on is the more optimistic uh, scenario, which shows uh, the low point being right now. And uh, as we pull out of uh, the second quarter of 2020, we'll start to see uh, things pick up. We've had some evidence of that with uh, some decent job reports and retail spending picking up and so forth. The um, uh, green uh, bar show uh, scenario B, which is a much deeper effect where uh, we go deeper uh, to a, a, a I hate to use the over overused word unprecedented, but a you know a, a level of um, uh, uh, contraction of the economy at 27, 25 percent, which we haven't seen since the 30s, 1930s, and in that case, it's a much longer scenario. But the point is that um, whether it's scenario A or scenario B, uh, we're going to see um, you know the tech industry, the tech market. We're going to see a drop of uh, you know five percent in scenario A. Uh, and, and much more uh, sharply in scenario B. So there's going to be a, a you know, like all recessions, there's going to be a cap on, on, on discretionary spending. Uh, this is some data that you can review later, but depending on what industry you're in, the um, ability to spend uh, dollars on uh, technology is going to be you know, restricted, um, more, you know, more so obviously in, in the harder hit industries uh, as in entertainment and leisure and oil and gas. Um, under either scenario, but basically, you know, we're going to go through a, a, a bit of a difficult period here. Our advice um, is really to 
uh, when you're interacting with your providers of technology, whether it's an outsourcing contract you have, uh, whether it is um, you know a technology uh, only uh, contract, um, you know, um, ask for pricing models that, that 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 reflect these new realities, and try to link the payments to uh, business performance so that the um, outgoing money from you to the provider is is aligned with the business value you're getting, uh, which is going to be very, very, very critical um, you know, as you move forward. So, you know, with all this, you say, well, there's not going to be a lot of spending on technology. Uh, however, when you look at intelligent automation, which is the subject of this discussion, and particularly RPA and BPM, um, and you look at the financial services industry, which, you know, if you looked at that chart, they were uh, hurt, but they weren't hurt as significantly as they were in 2008, 2009. Uh, and, and so they should be in a position to, um, you know, to take a more innovative approach with some of this automation. But what's interesting uh, to me in particular, who's been studying digital transformation at companies for, oh, uh, you know, five years, seven years, we've been talking about it is this very slow pace of transformation that we've seen. Now we call it phase one here in the chart. Phase two really is this slow um, you know, uh, application of automation to uh, basically improve productivity and so forth, but it hasn't been really um, that accelerated. Um, one would call it sort of anemic in, in, in a way. Uh, but then we hit the pandemic and we had this uh, surge in transformation uh, it's been said that we've had more digital transformation in the last uh, two months than we've had in the last two years. And you certainly can see that, whether it's work from home using collaboration technologies, whether it's companies forced to uh, restructure their supply chain uh, to do things more online, uh, just all of this very um, high stress you know, reaction to where we've been has really pushed transformation and and, and by extension, it's, it's pushed the, um, the interest in intelligent automation because a lot of that underlying um, transition is supported by uh, software capabilities that are within this intelligent automation umbrella. So when you look at where um, your roadmap was pre-pandemic uh, and where your roadmap is now, um, you've seen a lot of change. Uh, perhaps the uh, more transformational AI business transformational projects um, that we're focusing on engagement and customer experience, you know, maybe they've lost a little momentum in your organization. And maybe you've shifted to the upper right of this chart, which shows that there, you know, you have to be able to do remote business. You know, you have to be able to have um, in, in, in banking, there are still of our 4,000 retail banks, they're probably you know, um, 2,000 that don't have mobile deposit. Um, there are another, um, you, know, you know, there are 40% of uh, insurance companies that haven't even started to adopt electronic signature uh, for transactions um, that still require face-to-face -face agent interaction to get things done. Um, so remote business is absolutely critical. Um, being able to support remote workers. Uh, we're, we're doing some calculations of the number of um, uh, work from home prior to the pandemic and post pandemic. Um, and, and we're trying to get to where it'll stabilize. Um, and what we're looking at is that some uh, additional 10 million workers that have more or less desk jobs today will be moved in, 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 in the US, will be moved to more permanent uh, work from home uh, employees. Uh, now this is, uh, this is pretty dramatic. Uh, that this is a sea change. So being able to use automation to support remote work, and I'll talk a little bit more about that yeah, in, in a minute. Um, these all focus on um, doing business um, and, and cost reduction, and that's why you see RPA task automation uh, in that upper right. And I'll talk about text analytics, which is a very important aspect of this acceleration zone. The other aspect I'll just mention is resilience. Resilience really re referring to being able to deal with um, systemic shocks like this, uh, much more of a focus from a governance, from a board level. Um, how can I diversify my supply chain so I'm not so dependent on this highly tuned centralized source of critical supplies? Uh, how can I use robotics and intelligent automation helping with that? 
how can I ensure the right cloud capacity? So this is how your 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 automation roadmap has been um, jolted and reconfigured uh, post pandemic. But within all that, um, you know, RPA remains uh, very popular. Uh, organizations want to buy bots. Um, they want to have digital workers that are now in the loop with humans. Um, so there's a uh, push and pull or a headwind and tailwind with um, RPA investment uh, going forward. The uh, headwind you've already seen in terms of the uh, dampening of um, tech expenditure across all industries. The headwind is this surge in digital transformation that's occurring. Um, and RPA provides a very, um, very tactical, uh, very uh, get, your, get your arms around ROI, um, and particularly when combined with um, digital process automation or BPM, it's a very nice um, you know, level one or two process um, that, that can really yield a lot of value. Now, um, there, there's a lot of discussion always about the distinction between robotic process automation and business process management or DPA. So one of the ways I make that distinction is that you know, RPA handles tasks. So when you look at something being done in your back office, um, call it uh, Harry. You know, Harry is um, doing a reconciliation of some kind, um, maybe in the accounts receivable department. Um, so there are four or five screens that Harry's working with, um, entering data, copying and pasting, data entry, uh, putting in uh, commands to generate a report. These are the kind of things that Harry's doing. That might be an 18 minute, set of steps and actions and mouse movements that Harry does, oh, 37 times a week. And there might be 100 Harrys. So I can build a bot that does exactly what Harry does uh, and extract those minutes and those hours collectively out of that department. But it's very much a, a short, uh, repetitive, very structured uh, task. Uh, now, um, if you find tasks like that and meet these characteristics, this is called the Forrester's Rule of Five. I've uh, been very, very effective um, heuristic for understanding where to apply RPA versus where to apply digital process automation and how that works in financial services. But if you have a, a very few decisions that the bot needs to make, that's good. Um, you know, the BPM um, has been built over the years to have real decision management. You know, there's a, um, a way to view the rules in the system in a you know, English-like way. Uh, there's versioning on the rules. Um, you can handle uh, hundreds and hundreds of rules um, you know, in, in, in these platforms. Um, you get beyond five in a bot and the script's becoming very complicated and difficult to maintain. Now, the talent of RPA going to the applications access is, is really manipulating applications on desktop the way a human would. But you know, the, there, there, there's a reason that we um, use APIs. Uh, APIs are used to get below the surface, in a sense, to um, insulate you from higher level changes in applications so that your connectivity isn't, isn't effective. Um, so, that abstraction has been extremely valuable for the development and uh, you know technology uh, overall. Um, there's no such insulation with with bots because they're operating as Harry would on the screen. You're doing a UI level integration, so the susceptibility to changes in the application is quite high. So you want to keep the number of applications modest, and then you want to find that 18 minute or nine minute or even two minute um, you know uh, click stream. Um, that 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 is the is a good one to automate. So so that's kind of you know where um, you know RPA really started. Um, so what what where it's developing now is it's starting to add uh, BPM. Um, it's it's adding um, um, AI components um, and it's it's becoming an orchestration capability for more intelligence. Uh, the current stage that is a, a, a you know being invested in quite a bit by, by financial services companies is enhanced digitization, that's stage two. So if you think of it very simply, the RPA bots handle structured data only, you know, tagged files, XML files, JSON files, um, you know, clearly articulated record layouts in Oracle um, and SAP um, or your core banking system. 
So in order to make them more productive, um, use natural language processing, maybe in combination with some surface automation like computer vision, um, and be able to go into emails and forms um, and, and documents um, and, and extract a clean set of data, classify the, the, the documents coming in, but really get to that clean set of data, then the bots can do things with it. So in financial services, we're seeing this as a very, very strong play, um, whether it's uh, loan documents <clears throat> that are coming in. You know, imagine if you could extract very cleanly and create a table of all the relevant fields from a complex series of mortgage documents or loan documents. And then you, you're able to see, um, you know, compare one field to another um, and look for anomalies, you know, look for errors and be able to um, um, correct those errors at the front end of the process. But you see someone that checked married here and single here, you know, a bot can send a notification to the advisor um, to, uh, or send a notification directly to the client and, and get resolution of that before it gets to the back office, where if you're familiar with the NIGO processes, not in good, good order processes in most financial services back offices, they're very expensive um, and lengthy, and they, they degrade the customer experience. So be able to do that up front is really, really valuable. You know, in financial services, there's um, whole levels of regulated uh, fraud analysis that has to occur, anti-money laundering, uh, transactional-based um, analytics. <clears throat> but there's a lot of things that you can find from extraction of data that leads you to potentially bad exceptions or uh, just, just abnormal behavior. So you can add with this clean set of data that's extracted, which nat with natural language understanding and processing and so forth, um, you, you know, you can do some data modeling and, and really try to understand and send them to a queue to be resolved earlier. Um, also in financial services, uh, sentiment is really important. Um, being able to look at that set of data and say, you know what, this customer looks pretty angry. Um, and I know none of you have angry customers, but uh, occasionally maybe one of your peers do. Um, and let's route it to the group that handles angry customers really well, or that handles um, you know, certain exceptions really well. So all of that can be done very, very easily at stage two, uh, which is a really key area in financial services. Now stage three is, is where you really start to integrate um, and use the, uh, the intelligent automation platform to start to bring together um, AI building blocks and apply them to a use case. And in financial services, we're seeing this occur where um, you know, you know, um, you know, commercial banking, for example, is <clears throat> moving um, decision management um, to a machine learning environment and using the orchestration capability of RPA to link that decision with actual digital worker um, activity, which is the task automation of RPA, and using DPA, which I'll show in a minute, being able to link that uh, with the human in the loop activity uh, you know, to route work to the human queues at the original point. So if you think about it, you have BPM, digital process automation, you have uh, our RPA, and then you have these intelligent components, which could be conversational as well. Um, you know, how many <clears throat> um, uh, chatbots, uh, if you look at the use of the uh, primary banks, um, chatbots, Bank of America and so forth, they were really uh, had much heavier volume um, in, in the pandemic period. Um, and being able to link that conversation, understanding the intent of the customer and able to link that with digital workers that can get work done. Uh, for that customer is is accelerating. We're expecting that to be in the acceleration zone. So very, 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 very powerful. Um, this is a view of all the intelligent automation components. And the point we like to make here is pretty simple. <clears throat> it's not just the newer stuff that we're talking about. It's not just DPM, digital process automation wide. DPA wide is the really the low code version of BPM that's being used in financial services companies that have higher and higher talent levels in the business for digital. Uh, they're starting to build processes you know, independently of central technology management. That's the DPA wide approach. Um, but you have the text analytics I just talked about and, and the different versions of RPA 
attended mode, which is more agent-led, and unattended, which is more back office. But there are also a lot of intelligent automations that have been um, you know, around for a long time that should be maintained um, you know, around e-signature platforms. Uh, again, that's a ramping area for doing remote business. Uh, workload automation, which schedules batches and you know for mainframe operations, they're still doing a lot of the, you know, when you do a three-way commit for a transaction in, in banking, um, that that's probably done with some coordinated uh, workload automation, um, you know, across a number of mainframe and non-mainframe platforms. So a lot of these things, customer communications management, have been around for a while, but they're still, um, you know, maintaining. Um, you should maintain them. They have high business value and also high maturity. But don't forget innovation in that lower left. That's the the um, you know low business value today because it's it's not um, as mature. Um, and you know uh, and because of of the low maturity. But this is where you can maybe use this period to uh, do do some transformational projects and try to really get ahead of your competition if they are. Uh, in more survival mode or in more cost avoidance mode, you can do some interesting things in that experiment quadrant. Um, although we do think, as I said before, that some of those projects, um, you know, will be moved uh, kind of um, off to the side. Now, um, this is an example in financial services that's always been an issue. You know, this um, customer onboarding, uh, whether it's in wealth management, um, you know, very, very, you know, your customer experience in wealth management is determined a lot by not only your first boarding, uh, whether it be a brokerage or investment management company, but also in how easy is it to get into new and additional investment products. Um, if you have to go back to the check and app approach of the 1970s and be faxing in uh, material um, and, and need wet signatures, um, you know, th this is a terrible experience. In, in 2020 to have for your customers. Um, so the ability to use these intelligent automation capabilities to really, to, to, you know, to really make that a better experience, this is a time to do it. There's a lot of pressure to do it better. This is an example of doing remote business. Um, so we expect to see the intelligent capture that I talked about um, to, to absorb content from documents coming in. We expect to see um, process automation that's really BPM wide and BPM deep. We expect to see RPA, that's task automation on the bottom, and more of these specialized collaboration. You know, we've all gotten more comfortable with, with Zoom land in the, in the last two months. <clears throat> and, you know, it's pretty easy extension to see that companies will want to have very uh, domain specific collaboration around a transaction, uh, to have document sharing, to have a a particular set of experts that come on securely that have all of the maybe e-notarization and e-signature and communications management being able to create a point of service communication in relatively real time all of these things are going to be part of that collaboration which is going to get more domain specific uh, this is an exciting area this is uh, just showing you how to use that intelligent document extraction um, in in the insurance uh, market uh, this is just, um, you know, a very uh, uh, strong insurance company, American Fidelity, um, that yeah, has very, very successfully, um, you know, goes into emails. Um, you know, instead of having humans read them, um, the the analytics determine what's needed. They route the email to the most appropriate department. Um, you know, they just save a lot of time. You know, these are these don't sound like really uh, transformative processes, but they're ones that we're going to be focused on because they save a lot of time. This is how customer service in financial services is really taking advantage of some of the RPA automation. Um, what I like is the bonus territory up in the right. This is where you have a task, that, a bot that's put in that is, you know, providing higher customer experience, uh, but also higher productivity. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's a win-win situation. You know, the ability to pool data from customers by going into core systems and bringing it to one spot, uh, bringing it to a, a wealth manager, a financial advisor, bringing it to a customer service person in the credit card division um, so that they can really handle the order. They, they, they show they understand the customer. You know, um, you, you can do a lot of this without the big upgrade to the CRM system. 
You know, you can just go have bots that, you know, that say, please give me an account number and then go off and get everything you know about that customer from all your core systems and maybe maybe from social media as well because um, they can go out to websites as well. Um, so you bring it all back in in real time and now you can have a real conversation with the customer. We expect this to really continue uh, to develop um, agent guidance, um, you know, putting in the correct, um, even on the left, the ROI land grab, uh, you know, putting in the correct address field. You know, a lot of these customer service uh, staff have to up update four or five different systems with uh, post call notes and, and addresses. And if you do that wrong, that, that can really be bad. You, know, you can send the credit card to the wrong address, you know, for credit card renewal um, or a lost credit card. So these are just areas that in the customer service area of financial services that we're seeing intelligent automation take off. And I, we, we get asked a lot, you know, just how does RPA differ from DPA? I talked about that earlier a little bit, but, you know, DPA has evolved over decades and its goal initially was continuous improvement. You know, the idea was you, you had a view of the process for orchestration. It was a task based view. You expected to change that over time. You expected to get metrics, uh, maybe do simulations and basically adjust the process over time. Um, it was it was meant to be allow you to to do a roadmap for continuous improvement. You know, RPA doesn't do any of that. It just assumes you're going to leave the process as is, and it's going to lift out tactical um, efficiencies. You know, where 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 it can. So um, this is how they work together. They really were had different design points. Uh, our, you know, RPA is in charge of the the end to end process, the overall process. Um, and in this case, um, these are processes that have very deterministic aspects. In other words, you have the steps clearly articulated, um, you know, in, in a process map. Um, you know, so you have a step one where the RPA bots are working right alongside the humans. It's a queue. The, you know, the, the, the humans are pulling down work one after another. Uh, the RPA bots are pulling down work right next to them. So they're your, the buddy you can't see, the invisible robot, as we call it, is working with you. But a lot of um, bots fail. Uh, there's not a very good resilience in the current generation of RPA bots. So when they uh, have a change in an application, they break sometimes. And so you need to route around failed bots. Uh, BPM can understand you know, whether they're up or not and can you know, route to a remaining queue uh, of humans to, to get work done. But the biggest is step three there, where, where you're, you're really, you know, uh, DPA focused on APIs, and they have API insights and visibility and, and some level of API management. But really, when you came to a system uh, in, in integration that didn't have an API, they were nowhere. So RPA fills that gap. It's a it's a middleware that, that that can go in through UI integration and get the data in a core system. And that's a really big boom. And when you work them together, you get this kind of synergy. Um, you know, this is sort of the progression of that. Um, you know, ultimately, um, workers, employees will have, the, the, you know, they'll become bot masters. They'll they'll have their own robots to enhance and manage and personalize. And the UIs for uh, interacting with that robot, so uh, that's that's on the whiteboard right now. That's not really out there, but at some point we'll come up with a way that works uh, for humans to interact with their employee robots. Um, and this is just a, a view of what that might look like. I mean, you're going to have digital assistants. We're already using them. You have digital assistants you're talking to in the car, right? So you'll have uh, digital assistants that will be in, in, inside the firewall, probably by Google and Microsoft, that will allow you to, you know, do the kinds of things you might have had real assistants do in the, uh, in, you know, the madman days, right, of having real human assistants, calendar management, rent me a car. But then you're going to have domain-specific robots that, that really focus on a particular thing. I'm a contract specialist robot. I'm an invoice specialist robot. We're seeing that develop already. And a lot of the um, robotics we're talking about here um, are really RPA-specific robots. So I think there are going to be lots of robots. They're going to come from different platforms. They're going to support different uh, knowledge workers. Now, back office resiliency is a real issue. Now you have these 10 million additional um, you know, permanent work from home that were no not work from home before the pandemic. So how do you build resiliency for them? Well, you build a digital workforce that can be allocated and 
and and and um, you know uh, load level work, uh, and this is one of the bright areas for that, which is just finance and accounting, which is a you know a, a, a every company has a financial accounting department, so you're doing monthly and quarterly close reconciliations, consolidations, general ledger. Uh, it's been a very ripe spot for RPA to begin with, and now it has this COVID twist. Of, of having a creating some resiliency with a more distributed workforce. So just a few more slides from me. Um, what we're recommending for companies to build scale, which is one of the problems you have in 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 the development of automation right now, is that companies um, get stalled. Um, you know, they 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 don't have the organizational process to start building automations at scale. So this is a process we recommend. You have some way to get to the domain, which is the business, and to create some ideation. You know, take that sticker off, sticky note off the whiteboard, get it into a system. Maybe that's crowdsourcing. Maybe that's just a collaboration portal. Maybe that's just a survey form. But then have it go to, um, you know, an initial assessment, rule of five. Maybe that's done via a, a template that's provided to the business. Maybe that's done by the automation strike team, which is your center of excellence. So you, have, you then have a business case, uh, which is kind of a standard approach for moving the automation to the next gate. And then this area of digital worker analytics, which I, I don't have time to go into, but you really want to look at it. It's, it's the ability to put listening agents um, for and do recordings of actual human inputs and outputs, um, but not just on one station. Do it on 100 station or 500. And then have all those recordings come back to uh, an analytics environment and have machine learning do what it does best. Isolate patterns, find patterns, and it'll find the patterns that are standard in that process that everybody is doing in a repetitive fashion. And that's what you need to do. Um, that's what you need to understand to build the right bot for. That's how you find the right uh, process to build a bot for. Um, so, and then information technology has its piece too. But every company as we move into this next era, um, should have a, um, a more holistic process for isolating and, and figuring out how to get automations into a pipeline of development. This is what a center of excellence or a strike team looks like. Domain experts, you have a strike team, which might be, you know, generally that's led by an enterprise architect or someone from tech management that's at a higher level, maybe reports to the CIO. It's really business-based though. You know, you, you really have to have a, a lot of strong stakeholders from the domain process ownership, change management, design and maintenance, which will be done in the business. You know, this is a very federated type of technology. You know, the BPM world's moving to low code. Um, the RPA world is already there. Um, the technical talent in the business is growing. It's gonna be more federated. So you really need this type of organization to be able to really manage it. If you do it right, and you align the automation technologies on the right, with the uh, personas, the work personas on the left, the different levels of knowledge workers, the cubicle workers, the coordinators, this is forestry's taxonomy for the future of work. Then you can have a tremendous uh, impact. That $130 billion there is, is really um, your um, extraction of economic value by applying automation. That's just in one year. Uh, if you start now and you start planning in 2022, we can, in aggregate in the U.S., take out that amount of economic value. In other words, we can free up those hours to deal with the recession, to deal with innovation, uh, to move staff from the back office to the front office. So with that, um, I'll put in a shameless plug for my book, Invisible Robots in the Quiet of the Night. Um, this is um, came out in uh, late 2019 and uh, really describes the focus we need on the robots we don't see. It's not the robots you see uh, in the factory or on um, commercials. It's these robots we're talking about. These are the ones that are going to change the workforce um, in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. I think that was a wonderful presentation, which puts in a lot of emphasis on where the robots are going to be, how the three technologies coming together for RPA, DPA, and AI. And indeed, the automation goes beyond the RPA and DPA that we are so used to. While one concentrates on bots and the other concentrates on the human elements. The, I think both of them requires a perfect harmony 
for for things to work together the two by two that you showed was a perfect representation of how things are at the moment and how they would look in the future interestingly the hitl example brings out the use cases of rpa and tpa working together however it's not just about the customer for financial services if you look at it holistically it's about the employees partners customers and the entire ecosystem which needs to come in together to make that difference um, the task at hand is how do you marry the two technologies together apply ai and then make it work in a very very seamless manner with everyone perplexed i think from a dilemma perspective as to how more can things be done and automated let's hear mr varun goswami and how dpa and rpa come in together to offer the solution over to you varun Oh, thanks, Ritesh, and uh, thanks, Craig, for those wonderful insights. I will be talking about uh, RPA, and I'll be talking about uh, DPA and combination of DPA and RPA in this uh, in this session. Now, before I start, let me uh, go back to basics. And if you look at it, RPA has taken over the business and the enterprise sector by storm last two to three years. The the RPA market has been growing exponentially and along with that, of course, evaluations of these uh, companies. And, uh, you know, it is easy to see or it is easy to understand why RPA has this kind of a pull. Uh, if you look at it, if you look at the ease of design, uh, the, the potential for error reduction, the cost optimization potential, it makes for a very compelling business use case for RPA. And as RPA continues to grow, eventually moving into an intelligent process automation scenario. DPA has a very important role to play. And in fact, DPA becomes a stepping stone for RPA to move into an intelligent automation scenario. Now, why does where does DPA fit in? I'll be talking about in more details. And we talked about RPA growing exponentially and along with that, of course, there have been some implementation challenges that have come into the picture. So if I talk about a standalone RPA implementation, the first, foremost and the biggest challenge that comes is an overall process orchestration. So within RPA tools, there is a lack of uh, you know, orchestration between humans and bots. How, how, do, how, how does one amount of work finish from a human move to a bot? and then uh, maybe back to a human for review. Exception management is one big area uh, where if there are any issues and if there are any errors, because uh, RPA bots are typically fragile in nature. They work at the UI level. Any changes in the application tend to uh, you know, affect these bots badly. So how do you, in case there's an issue, how do you manage those exceptions? Uh, data visualization is a challenge. So because there are multiple applications, multiple tools, how do you get a common view of what is happening across the entire process? Uh, use cases are limited for standalone RPA. When I say limited, majority of the use cases are in the financial services sector. Uh, beyond that, ownership and you know even just the ability to define the right activity for automation also becomes a challenge. So looking at all of these challenges, you know, how does DPM uh, address, help address some of these challenges? Now, if you look at it, uh, you know, RPA, like I mentioned before, RPA works best when the interfaces and the processes don't change very rapidly. Whereas in today's dynamic era, uh, digital era, these things don't remain static for too long. So the suggestion, comes out that in case you already have, you know, no matter where you are in your automation journey, there's always scope for improvement. In case you already have a BPM layer running and some level of process or, uh, designing and automation has already been done, RPA adds a huge value in terms of 
removing the repetitive rule based or mundane tasks from humans and allowing the bots to do these activities while rolling out and because bpm tends to run on top of certain applications you know day zero availability of integration apis might not be there so rpa plays a very important role in terms of non-invasive integration in case you're already in the automation scenario where you have rolled out rpa adding bpm to that journey has a huge advantage a customer service and robotic exception handling can be handled with case management scenarios so for every exception a new case can be allocated to a, to a human and they can you know the work doesn't stop they can look at the case they can resolve it and the work keeps on moving right and beyond that orchestration of the end-to-end -end process the rules management and even the visibility of what is happening inside your process is something that bpm does very well so this is where bpm and rpa come together to what we call the robotic process management or rpm which helps you achieve end-to-end -end process automation, orchestration, and better and more straight-through processing in your business processes, right? Uh, this is the same slide that Craig was also talking about, where cube, there is a process orchestration layer at the back end, and humans and bots work on different queues within that process. They pick up items, process them, and save them back into the queue the rule definition the complex rule definitions of what to do with an application or what to do with a certain item is something that the business rules management system within a bpm system is much better equipped to handle rather than you know hard coding those rules in a bot script so this is where bots and humans can work together on a single rp orchestration or rp process the RPM approach is essentially a four-step approach where the first and foremost is the activity identification. So having an analytical engine that simulates the process and identifies the bottlenecks within the process is very important. Having an integrate, uh, having a layer in which both commercial, non-commercial, uh, web or desktop-based automation bots can be automated. A single control center, and this is also very important because many organizations are going into a multi-vendor rp approach so with that happens you really want a single place from where you can control or monitor or allocate work to different types of bots which is where a centralized control center is very important and finally a business activity monitoring tool which shows you real time what is happening in your process so where are the bottlenecks you know uh, in a process, the moment you put a bot work step, and bot by definition works much faster than humans. Uh, once you have automated a certain activity, how do I ensure that I have actually optimized my process or I have simply, you know, moved the bottleneck from this work step to somewhere down the stream? So identifying having a real time application monitoring, which tells you what is the health of the process, how is the health behaving? And then going back to the first web step, identifying the activities which can be automated, which is the basic tenet of uh, BPM or DPA, continuous intelligence, continuous improvement in the process. I'll spend a few minutes talking about the Nugen robotic process management suite. And this is the same approach that we've taken. So what we have done is we have built a, uh, we have built a process designer where uh, uh, the complete process can be mapped and within that process human and bot tasks can be clearly delineated so apart from that there's a centralized control center through which multiple types of bots can be configured and controlled so this is very important from a manageability or a governance perspective on top of that we have different types of bots we have a basic web and excel automation bots uh, we have uh, third-party commercial bots that can be mapped on the same platform and we also have certain intelligent cognitive bots that i'll be talking about in more detail uh, so there are two types of intelligent bots that i uh, i would like to talk about and uh, which gives you an example of the power of intelligent automation and what it can achieve uh, in the future so one of them is a text analytics bot now this is something which is which looks at different texts. It could be emails, it could be Facebook posts, it could be Twitter uh, you know, posts on, on your handles or your Facebook page. 
and it can identify what is the customer trying to say. So it can find out what is the sentiment of the customer. Is it positive, negative, neutral? It can take out the key keywords out of that. So what is the customer actually talking about? What is the intent of the customer? Is it a request? Is it a complaint? Is it a compliment? The confidence score and also identifying who is the customer that is talking. Right. So getting all of this information is very useful for doing an automated query resolution or automated case resolution. I'll be talking about a use case uh, or a case study uh, further in my presentation where we used uh, an intelligent agent to automate the service request management for one of our customers. The other intelligent bot that I wanted to talk about is a document classification bot. Now, when uh, when uh, you're asking for your customers to upload certain documents, which could be invoices, which could be, you know, uh, driving license, passport, national IDs, having, identifying whether this is the proper document, this is the right document or not, becomes very cr crucial for straight through processing. So in case there is any issue with the document, the bot can flag it right there and ask the customer to upload the right document rather than the document reaching somewhere in the back end somebody manually verifying it and then sending it back for rebirth. So this has this type of bot has been able to, uh, you know, save a lot of time, a lot of rework for some of our customers. These are AI based bots. So they actually look at the image data and these are based on machine language or machine learning. And using ML and AI, they're able to identify whether this is the right type of document for this category. Right now. What are the advantages of having this kind of this kind of an approach? I think the biggest advantage is in terms of efficient governance, because now in a single place you can view what all bots are doing, what all humans are doing. The audit trails that you take out from the system can actually tell you what happened with this item. So which bot worked on it? What were the data values that were set? Which human worked on it? What were the activities that they performed? You have a single audit rate across multiple different activities and multiple types of actors on those activities. The reporting, because now you have end-to-end -end view of your process, not just individual activities. Because these use inbuilt connectors for communicating with the underlying BPM layer, they are much more secure and much, uh, you know, much less fragile uh, as compared to a UI-based integration and exception management becomes seamless. So anytime a bot fails, it immediately creates a work item in the case management flow and somebody can look at it and ensure that the work does not get impacted. Uh, I was talking about customer success stories. So these are two success stories that I wanted to share on this platform. One of them has been a leading bank in Kuwait where they had, they had automated their account opening on top of a BPM platform. But there were certain activities as part of that account opening journey, which were repetitive activities. So one of this was a blacklist check, which had to be done through some uh, regulatory bodies. And another was an AML check, again, for which there was no application API available. So using a combination of BPM and RPA, we were able to automate their complete end-to-end -end journey. There was a 70% reduction in overall turnaround time of the checking specifically and it was a better more enhanced customer experience because now the number of rework that had to be done was much less the other example that i wanted to talk about which is actually of an intelligent automation is a leading bank in united arab emirates where their customers were connected to them through their digital channels and while they had a traditional crm system in place the, uh, the the struggle was in, th in terms of identifying what is a customer saying and responding back immediately to the customer. So with the changing, uh, you know, customer behavior, especially when it comes to social media, instant gratification, uh, you know, has become a very, very important part. So just sending a generic response saying that, you know, we have received your query and we will get back to you in X number of days simply doesn't cut it anymore. It, the responses have to be context specific. And that is where the intelligent text analytics bot has come in. Uh, it listens on multiple channels and it also supports multiple languages. So both English and 
it identifies the customer it identifies the customer sentiment what is the customer trying to say the keywords and does a straight through processing of most of the service requests with few service requests going for manual verification so this is so these are a couple of examples where intelligent automation and dtm have come together to better improve the customer experience and allow for a much faster processing of customer requests and customer applications uh, with that i'll just talk about uh, newgen so we are a global provider of dpm business process management intelligent business process management enterprise content management case management and customer communication management uh, applications and we are amongst we are listed in the forester wave and the gartner nqs for all of these application areas that i just talked about so with that i would like to hand it over back to ritesh for the q and a session back to you ritesh thank you varun that does bring in a new perspective to looking at bots and looking at the humans working together uh we have some questions from the team uh, from the participants as well and it's really interesting to kind of see those in the new light so probably the first question that we'd like to take is for uh you varun what capabilities of rpa has in terms of case management do you think rpa and bpm are converging in the industry and is being aided by technologies like ai ml and things like that i remember you talking about a small example in the financial services space if you could just elaborate on that varun Okay, while well, probably Varun joins oh, back. Ritesh, uh, you Ritesh, were sorry, I, I, I yeah. Uh, so Ritesh, could you please come again? Okay. So what what the audience wants to know are what are the capabilities that RPA has in terms of case management, and do you think the RPA and the DPA industry is converging? and it's being aided this convergence is being aided by technologies like ai ml and things like that uh, i remember you taking a small example but if you could just put throw some light on the same okay okay uh, so ritesh there are two parts to your question so i think uh, one talks about where rpa and dpa kind of converge and uh, so i think let me just let me just uh, first address that part if you look at it where rpa started from was the focus of rpa was on automating tasks that typical uh, you know people do we do on a daily basis uh, so the focus of rpa is on task activity automation and rpa does that part very well on the other hand the focus of a dpa or a bpm system is to look at the end of end to end process orchestration right so both of them have their niche areas and both of them are geared towards doing these specific areas very well where they converge is ultimately they are both trying to automate the the set of or series of activities that are happening to achieve a certain objective or a certain outcome so if i talk about an account opening example account opening there would be a certain set of activities and a certain set of handoffs between from one person to another person with rpa coming in that has become from one person to a bot or bot to a person or bot to a bot right so dpa or bpm allows you to orchestrate between these sets of activities so that your end to end process can be orchestrated or can be automated okay and 
do you think that these technologies are converging? Uh, absolutely, I think. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, because if you look at it, the end objective of both the technologies is the same. It is ultimately automating the uh, automating the process, right? So they are somewhere they are converging, but still the focus that they have is remains different. So although the end objective remains the same, the the methodology that the path that both the technologies have taken or both the tools have taken are very different. But yes, ultimately they both have to work together to be able to achieve the end objective. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, Varun. I think that brings in a lot of clarity. Craig, um, in today's scenario, probably I think people have got tired of seeing COVID through, but COVID and post COVID, do you think RPA and DPA can together add value to the financial services industry? Do you think that it's actually uh, in the future as well? Um, would RPA kind of gain an upper hand over DPA or probably both will have an equal play in today's, uh, in tomorrow's times? Um, it's, it's um, you know, I think that they will be on equal plane for a while, uh, but it really depends on how much of the newer analytics get embedded in the RPA platforms. So, for example, we're seeing in the document extraction text analytics world um, that probably half the RPA platforms have embedded their own NLP solution into their platforms. Um, however, we're not seeing um, you know, chatbots and conversational intelligence and machine learning uh, for decision management become part of the RPA platform. So they're more getting linked in. Um, so, um, you know, the progression, it's it's really going to be determined by the, the, the upper hand question will be determined by, um, you know, how valuable is that orchestration capability that RPA platforms have with their control uh, towers and orchestrators versus um, that end to end orchestration that BPM platforms have. Now, in the BPM case, they were designed for humans in the loop, you know, more so. I mean, they orchestrated really humans uh, from work queues. Um, the RPA perspective is, is really orchestrating uh, automations that operate more autonomously, like the task automation of RPA. Um, so um, I think that the orchestration capability is sort of an even battle right now, um, but the real determinant will be how actively, progressively do those AI, emerging AI components find themselves uh, being embedded in those, in those uh, RPA platforms. So far, the BPM community hasn't done as good a job of showing how it can use machine learning to really um, develop its capabilities in, in new and different ways. You know, when are you gonna start to take routing logic out of deterministic configuration in the BPM platform and start to link to machine learning to be able to dynamically route work uh, and orchestrate. That's the kind of thing we'll need to see from the BPM community in order to, um, to keep the race close. Perfect. No, I think that does make a lot of sense. Warren, do you, it's, it's a classic problem that when you have a DPA and an RPA and a AI all working together, how do you measure as to which process part is the right uh, kind of audience or the right candidate for the activity automation? And how do you see the two working together, the human and the bot working together? Yeah, Ritesh, I think that's a very good question because it it also hits upon the basic tenet as to how do you identify which activities to automate, you know, 
One way is, of course, go on the floor and see what are different people doing and try to automate that. A different methodology is also to have have a certain level of automation first, where you are able to get all of this data from the automation tool itself. And basis that you can actually see which activities are time consuming, because if you are trying to automate and see a bot also has a cost attached to it, right? So if you're trying to automate an activity, which is like probably takes half an hour on a daily basis, it might not make a very good use case to put a, a, a bot dedicated for that activity. Right? So having a basic automation in place and getting the data measured from there is a very good starting point for identifying which activities are actually taking time and cost. And, and that's, where, uh, it, it, that's where the measurement actually starts from. Thank you, Varun. Uh, Craig, a question for you from the audience. I think they're really intrigued by the level of details that you talked about. Are there any set processes or templates that are available from the RPA world, which can be directly lift and shift into the financial services space? Um, yes, yeah, so there are. Um, you know, a lot of the RPA platforms have communities that um, you can download uh, automations from that have been built by uh, their service company partners. And if you look through some of these communities like I have, they have, um, um, you know, they have artifacts, I would call them, that, um, you know, relate to um a you know bots that can help uh, financial advisors and wealth management you know bots that can do um retirement rollover support you know that's a big area where you um you know you're you know most of the brokerage world is trying to get um you know boomers to uh convert their other 401ks to their management and it's a perfect task for bots to go into the tables and go into the previous investments in that plan and lift them out and uh, re you know put them into the forms needed to convert them <laughs> you know um, so um, we're starting to see uh, those types of uh, templates emerge uh, but they would be from the service community partners the templates we're seeing from the uh, rpa vendors themselves tend to be you know, you know, with some exception, uh, you have some RPA vendors that are very focused on financial services. So they would have, um, uh, you know, things for claims management and insurance, um, you know, or, um, you know, uh, or, or onboarding. Uh, but the majority have been uh, packaging, um, you know, things like invoice processing um, and other areas in finance and accounting where, they're, they're not specific to financial services, they're financial applications that every company has. You know, that's been more the sweet spot so far for RPA, but it's moving pretty actively towards line of business. And as it does, you're gonna see more and more templates, um, you know, um, hit the market. Great. Great, so I think we are just running short of time and, uh, we probably can take up the last question that has been put up by one of our esteemed guests is how do you measure the performance warren of a bot and uh, a human onto the same platform would it make sense to kind of even compare the two when it comes to the the automation framework as such interesting question um yep. i would say that um you want to be careful about doing that that um humans are are concerned about uh, robotics and robotic uh, workers invisible robots if you will um that will be helping them <laughs> um so you know you you don't want to necessarily uh, have metrics side by side um, that are comparing the um, tasks that a bot is doing, and and they're, they're going to be different profiles and characteristics. You know that 
you know, 18 minute task I was talking about earlier, that might take the bot only six minutes or four minutes. Um, so you're not going to compare those types of metrics. It's just not a fair comparison. Um, you know, the, the error rate for a lot of the uh, task automation is, is, is non-existent. Um, you know, humans have an error rate. So I think you want to be very, very careful about that. Um, um, I think we're just at the beginning of trying to decide how to think about these um, digital workers in the context of working with humans and being monitored and, and managed and so forth. So um, I think you have to be very careful about that. No, that's that's good. I think that kind of does the job. We are just kind of uh, in time for uh, the closing notes. So thanks a lot for everyone for joining in this webinar and Mr. Varun and Mr. Leclerc for kind of the valuable insights that you kind of did for demystifying the RPA, DPA, AI, cognitive world today that we are all living in. And this does provide a very, very nice insight into how it's applicable to the financial industry. And I'm sure the audience over here would have been uh, very, very overwhelmed by the by the great level of um, discussions that we had today. Thank you for your time and thanks a lot for for joining in team. Thank you.